Yeah, let's start at the beginning. What what drew you to music? What were what were your first interactions? My first interaction was that, well, probably people already know that my family is there are no musicians at all. Like, well, my father is a psychiatrist, so look at me; it's a perfect match. <laughs> uh, my mom is an engineer. My sister is a ballroom dancer, and well, surprisingly, my mom found me jumping on the bed when I was three years old and like she didn't understand what to do because I was singing. I was singing some Robertino Loretti stuff because my, my grandfather, he, he used to be a huge fan of music and he listened classical, jazz, some old pop music and one of my favorite was the Robertino Loretti's Jamaica. And I jumped and sang and my mom called her friend and said, I don't know what to do. I mean, what's, what's going on with this guy? So and her friend said, don't worry, just bring him. Yeah, like that. <laughs> just bring him to music school. Uh, in Russia, we have a system that, that we have so many music school in different areas. Uh, well, as, especially in Moscow. And so he brought me, she brought me, and finally I passed the entrance exams, so that's how I started. And then, step by step, like of course I didn't want to practice at all, uh, but well, and, and I just practiced for myself, like just to grow, to improve, to improve my brain, sight, and the regular school as well. Uh, so I decided what to do, like it's, I, I played soccer, ping pong, I used to swim, uh, so things like that. Uh, however, at the age of 10, I won competition and the main prize was attending Summer Academy. Uh, in the very old ancient Russian town, very beautiful with beautiful churches uh, and the atmosphere, great. This town is called Suzdal. Very beautiful and very inspiring. And uh, one in international charitable fund called New Names, they organized Summer Academy. So I attended. There and I attended uh, professors' lessons. I remember I had six, and after that I decided that music is part of my life, and I wanna, I wanna do that. So that's how everything started regarding my love to music. What sort of uh, pieces were you playing? Like, what did you play to win that competition? And what were you playing for that? Like, easy children's piece. Like, there is a piece called Strange Walls by Dmitry Kob Kabalevsky. Uh, I played Rodion Shidrin Etude in A. <laughs> well, this is a big hello to Igor Stravinsky, like Serenade in A, so <laughs> like, and but it, it, both pieces were very short, like one minute each. But any any anyway, that, that that was fun. And then of course I started learning more and more and more complicated stuff. And well, I rem I still remember uh, my first how I said big piece, fifteen or twenty pages, called uh, variations on Nachtigall by uh, Mikhail Glinka. Uh, and yeah, I, I remember that that was scary. There were many 16 notes and I was just 11 years old and that, that was my big, big, first big piece. And very bright and, and of course it, it was famous in the audience and got many success uh, and I, I remember I enjoyed it working on it but 
that's how how I started improving. And then uh, I, I listened many recordings uh, of different pianists. My first big laugh was of course Vladimir Horowitz. And mine too. I yeah I listen. Well, this is my teenager rock star. Uh, and of course, I read David Dubal's book Evenings with Horowitz. And um, I listen, I think, all of his <laughs> recordings from very early ones from London in the 30s till the very last Weinen, Klagen, Zorgen, Sagen by Bach. And, and of course, Liebestod by Wagner. Which I've, uh, I've heard you play. And so, yeah, how do you, uh, what do you take from Horowitz, do you think? Like, how, how has he informed your artistry? Uh, since I, uh, I was a huge fan of him, I, I wanted to be like him. I said that, okay, I, I'm a pianist of an effect. Uh, I mean, okay, if you're a pianist of an effect, why just one? <laughs> Why <laughs> just like, but then there were some stupid things from me, 14 years old. Uh, yeah, I, I focused on colors in music, uh, in some effects. I try to do experiments with sound totally bright, totally loud, and as soft as possible triple pianissima, four pianissima, soft pedal, without soft pedal, all just high range, which Horowitz was famous for. So I tried to do that. And after that, I grew up more and more. And after that, I met my genius teacher in Moscow. Uh, and he explained me that there is not only Horowitz in our <laughs> life. We have some more pianists. I said, really? <laughs> Just a couple others. Yeah, and yeah, that's how I fell in love with some other pianists as well. But yeah, that's how I how I grew in in, in piano way. And at the same time, teacher asked me to read this book, that book, and that's how I started to grow as so-called well-rounded person uh, and of course life in in college was excellent like friends hanging out with them in, improving my human skills <laughs> and others so, uh, so if we were to say those Glinka variations or the yeah. variations on Glinka, which I, I'm not familiar with, I should I should listen to that. Yeah. Uh, if that was but, one uh, piece that was important, uh, pick like like two other pieces that have been very important in getting to where you are right now. You know. Well, like musically, I, professionally. No, my my first love, surprisingly, that was Arthur Rubinstein. Uh, well, speaking about Horowitz, which is totally opposite. Uh, but I remember when I was 11 or 12 years old, I heard Mephisto Waltz number one and how Arthur Rubinstein played it. And th that w was my first feeling when I felt tears in my eyes. Like, I, 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 I couldn't explain that. That was my ve very first experience when music or some music uh, brings me to tears. This is like, I didn't understand what happened. What happened with me? How, how, how is that possible? Well, very first time, like music could be so touching. It's not just like notes and the number of notes and certain amount of notes, but it is, more than that and that that's how i realized that notes mean nothing i did not i didn't understand that but i i felt it like my first experience in that and 
uh, probably C major sonata by Mozart, Kirchhill 545. Uh, my father played it because my father used to learn piano for several years and sometimes he sat down playing some music and I, I remember when he played the second movement of Mozart's C major sonata that was just like that's that's what I remembered and all these warm memories in my Moscow apartment and like evening and my father played and then I of course I could not sleep because I thought about the, that music uh, yeah that, that, that's what I what I miss and <laughs> that will not come back anymore so right Rubenstein many lovely works I remember mm. listening to uh, you know like Maybe having a Chopin Nocturne bring mm. tears, but the Mephisto Waltz, number one, huh? Yeah. Do you yeah. remember? Uh... I, I, I remember. I may, maybe if I if I listen to him, it, it, it will remind me some feelings. I haven't listened to that recording for maybe, well, 16 years or, well, since last time. But any, anyway, he recorded it in 1950s, so he was quite quite young <laughs> quite I mean <laughs> cool yeah so uh... you know that story uh, well how Rubinstein became more and more blind and well David Dubal described that that um, he attended the very last Rubinstein concert in Carnegie Hall and Rubinstein played Carnival and Dubal was impressed by Rubinstein's Paganini <laughs> because everything was clear and you know that well Rubinstein was also famous that even if he well he would not be Rubinstein if he didn't play dirty notes <laughs> <laughs> some of them <laughs> and Dubal realized uh, that well everything was clear and after recital, he came to Rubinstein, probably backstage, or they went to a restaurant or so, and he said, oh, maestro, everything was just perfect. And Rubinstein said, you know, after I got more and more blind, I couldn't treat my most favorite writers, Proust, Joyce, and I couldn't just have fun. However, I started practicing. <laughs> That's pretty. I I can't. I've heard, yeah, that he would not practice very much. Which how is that even possible? I, no, I I'm I'm with him. I'm with him. If you practice like nuts, <laughs> I, I I I don't like practicing. <laughs> well, it feels like. You kind of got to do it. Otherwise, how is Carnival going to get in your fingers, you know? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, depends, depends, depends. Depends on peace. So, uh, plan is you're, we're going to record Opus 119 and uh, of Brahms. Uh, Brahms had a pretty good run there on piano. 116, 117, 118, 119. All these great shorter pieces. Uh, yeah, maybe you could talk about how you chose uh, Opus 119. Well, the story that we are lucky to have all these four opuses for piano, because, well, we, we know that, that famous story that Brahms composed Opus 111, uh, and he decided that he would not compose anymore. So that would his very last piece. And um, finally, he heard Mulfeld, uh, a clarinetist, and he, he, Mulfeld brought his Brahms art back. So he composed trio, clarinet quintet, uh, two clarinet sonatas, Opus 120, and we, we are lucky enough that Brahms also composed 
all of this, Opus 1, 16, 17, 18, 19 for, for piano. All of them are different, but I, it was not like immediate journey how I was into Brahms. Um, I didn't understand what, what people found. And of course, that was probably Horowitz's influence because if you read David Dubell's book about Horowitz and how, how Horowitz played Piano Sonata Number no. 3 by Brahms, he said, oh, that's awful music. Awful, 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 awful. However, he played Brahms Sonata Number no. 3 and we had memories by Sofronitsky, how he learned that, that piece. But anyway, anyway, so I, I was under Horowitz influence uh, regarding that and I thought okay we need to go inside I need to go deeper when I was 16 17 18 I tried with Opus 117 I, I, I learned it I played a little bit and then stopped and then again and then back and forth I don't know, somehow I was at the concert and I finally heard one conservatory student and I don't even remember his or her name. But when this person started Opus 119 number one, I, I, I was shocked, literally. I, I, I could not, again, I could not explain what's going on regarding timing regarding reg regarding sound how how is that possible to create all these harmonies all these chords the very last chord just just burned me uh, like with all this dissonance and at the same time everything was so inner like like well we i hope you will hear it but the, the thing is, I felt that Brahms wanted to say something to us, but at the same time, at some point, and some reasons, he could not do that. Like something, like, does not allow him to do that. Like life or some outer things. But he wants to do that. And that feeling that you want but you are not allowed to do that. It's all about late Brahms. And that, that just brought me in, in some feelings which I again could not, could not describe. It is alike, it is totally opposite to Tchaikovsky, where that's, that's why probably they didn't like each other because <laughs> In, for, for Tchaikovsky, it is totally opposite. You want and you do that, and you do it till the end. Brahms is another story. So, uh, could you just walk through that Opus 119, number one? Like, just the piece, the form, what happens, how you think of it as you go? Standard, three-part form, um, like, like we we have our world well very very Sch schubertian thing <laughs> at some point we have our world which is negative uh, and we want to avoid it and at some point we want to lose in other world which could make us more happy or or so or probably we even had this world good world in our life but it does not exist anymore and at one point when we think that the happy world is the real thing we come back to our negative I'm a negative world back and that's that's how 
nowadays. It's it's qu quite simple. It's more like well, we, we start from Schubert and all of this the things where he wanted to find how Andras Schiff said wanted to find the room somewhere close to the roof of the house on the upper floor but we know that it's not possible and there is a movie by David Lynch called Mulholland Drive which is again kind of about the same thing where we have well it, it, it's kind of spoiler, so you just <laughs> skip it. Skip it, on. yeah, yeah, please. But uh, we have this world of our dreams where everything is so good, where we have our love and everything. But after that, we wake up and realize that that was just dreams after, after some alcohol or smoking something. Uh, <laughs> We, we and we come back how about that uh like that opening theme the main theme you know that comes back uh, a few times what are your how do you prepare to play that what are you feeling what do you want the audience to feel what do you think before you start that you know it's about time uh it's about how it how it came from is it is it coming from our real world or did it come from another world like it was it, it did exist before um, and it just appeared from 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 nowhere uh, it's the matter of um, it's the matter of timing between the notes it's about creating the harmony how it how it appears like from nowhere note by note and that's a big danger to to play it like just several notes with not creating the chord i i heard se se several times and th that's quite easy just to make no notes by note but not the chord and how you build the chord is very important and how you at the same time there are kind of lines which you need to build as well or which is more which is more tension which is less tension or even sometimes voltage uh, but again, it is the matter of time. You have to stop the time here. And that's what I hope all, all pianists try to do. So I looked at it a bit last night and uh, those opening measures, you know, a bunch of major and minor thirds. Yeah. The first measure is pretty cool how it goes like it's B minor on top of E minor. Yeah. Uh, but really, it just feels, yeah, just like you're saying, it's crazy to take just a bunch of thirds and then form pretty great harmonies. And uh, and there's, I was gonna say, hey, those opening measures, do you think there's more major or minor thirds? What do you, what's your gut say? This is neither major nor minor. It is, <laughs> <laughs> it is late romanticism. It is not about not about the thirds. It's, yeah, it's a tie. It's, it's seven to seven, yeah. which I thought was interesting. I kind of yeah. thought there'd be more. Uh, uh, I don't know, more minor, I guess. Well, it, it it is minor, of course, but yeah, the underlying piece is. Uh, I mean, it's in B minor, right? Yeah, I've I've always, from the first time I heard, it, I just felt like, I don't know, just kind of falling from somewhere, like drifting. I I don't know that. That opening is about as magic as an opening, I'd say, in music. Uh, and then it does come back, and it is simple. It's simple ABA, right? But, like, when it comes back, it's not all just thirds anymore. Like, the intervals change slightly, and the, but know, how it starts it comes to do triples, back. triplets and yeah. stuff, you know? And, yeah. uh, well, based on thirds, of course. 
yeah, then, you know, the other pieces are similar but different. Mm -hmm. Number four is, feels different from all the rest, you know? Mm -hmm. Like some triumphant, powerful conclusion. I don't know what... Maybe what are your what are your thoughts on the whole set? How it all fits together and well, that that fits number number two. Again, probably this is something one of the most unstable things I've ever had. We I've ever played. We cannot find the resolution in each each bar. There are no minor minor like really my e, e, e minor because the main the main key is e minor but you barely can find real e minor there there is something e minor with c and then some so, some dominance but again we cannot resolute and solve it and something like you 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 want to find the truth but you cannot find it but again there is another world where you can find the truth where you can well at, at the, the the theme is the same but in e major but th that's that's again great particularly in German music, how people, starting from Haydn, use the same theme, theme and create different characters, different moods, and different meanings of each of them. Um, and, 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 and again, something unstable, unsure, with all of this dissonance you you barely could hear consonants in in in, in this music like ag again you 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 cannot you cannot find something it's just like you're you're in the endless labyrinth you cannot find the exit from that and A real intermezzo after after that uh, C C major one which I love it's like like a, like a dancing but what kind of dance it is it's like when you when you lost everything and you you're dancing you're dancing alone with all of this stupid happy face <laughs> and Again, you, you, you imagine that there is a happiness around you. And then number four comes, Rhapsody, and which you already hear from the beginning, the catastrophe. Uh, even it's E flat major at the beginning, there's something like, there is a real power which destroys everything on its way. And the middle section again, like from C, C, C minor, starting from C minor, like it's, I remember when I heard the for first time, I said, "Oh my God, Lord of Rings!" <laughs> <laughs> but true, like a real, real epic and powerful power, <laughs> non-stop. And the, the, the ending is like, that's what we, we, we are waiting for. So that's very, very tragic opus, by the way. Yeah, Yeah, you think about how it starts versus how it ends. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, uh, and then the journey. It's, it's, it's a big journey, journey, all these four pieces. How long, you, you figure 15 minutes, something like that? Uh, 16, 16, 17. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it is not sonata like, but yeah, it's interesting that there's a there's a journey there across the opus, you know. It's a big journey. Well, all of his late opuses is a kind 
kind of journey, different journeys compared to Opus 117. It's totally another story, 116. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great run for Brahms, you know. Yeah. Maybe you talk about uh, how you got here. Where are we? How uh, we how'd are, you end up here? We are in a wonderful place. Now you should show <laughs> some shots from drawn from some Missouri River. We are on Missouri River. We are in Missouri. We're in Parkville, Missouri. One of my most favorite places, inspiring. Um, I love to feel when that I'm alone. Uh, and this is the best place for that. Some remarks. Uh, I love to feel alone when I have a chance to meet people. That's, that's, the, <laughs> most, <laughs> that's the most important thing. One of the scariest things that you're alone and that's it. <laughs> and that's it. Pure beauty and I mean, just look at the river. I, when I just came here, I thought probably some that I'm on the time machine moved through several centuries back and I thought, oh my God, probably some Native Americans <laughs> would appear and, and I don't know, I, I, I would greet them and say, say hello and the, the, the atmosphere of that is just like in, in, in incredible and and lo I feel lots of power here. And how, uh, what are you, what are you doing here? How'd you get here, you know? The story is that um, my professor, well, he's very popular in Russia in piano world and he used to give master classes in Moscow. I attended some of them and one day I decided, hey, why, why not to text him on Facebook? Like, hey, my name is Ilya from the yard. Uh, here are some of my recordings. Uh, why don't you want to listen to them? And surprisingly he did. And he replied and said, hey, well, was glad to hear you, but why don't you come to park for, for a lesson? So I will check how you react on my, on my suggestions, advices, and so on. So I finally did. I finally came and I played for him and he finally said, hey, welcome to park. Said, well, uh, well, how about how about auditions or so? No, no, no. We decide that. You are now student of Park University, ICM, International Center for Music. And yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's and, and and that's great. There's people here who've won international competitions, yeah. uh, gone to Juilliard, gone to Curtis. Curtis, probably Manhattan. New England Conservatory, Manhattan School of Music, um, and now many, many Parkville, others. Yeah, Missouri, now, which is a little different than Manhattan, you know? This is, this is the best school in the world. Uh, this is just like you don't have classes if you're graduate student. Well, I'm talking about graduate certificate and artist diploma, but no classes, you just sit down practicing, you have lessons with your professor and you have all chances to grow as a musician, as a person, uh, as to be smarter in some kind uh, there is a big danger not to do anything like but it's 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 up to you it's up to your strength and up i speak one two three four and 
I'm at Earl's Music Room and I'm happy to be back. And <laughs> and and glory to music.